India's digital way, the road to G20 and beyond. Joining Mr. Kant, we have with us Mr. Sunil Parthi Mittal, founder and chairman, Parthi Enterprises. So please. Ms. Nivruti Rai, country head, Intel India, and vice president, Intel Foundry Services, Intel Corporation. Nivruti. Ashley Tellis, Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs and Senior Fellow, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The conversation will be moderated by our friend, fellow supporter, by Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General, Research and Information System for Developing Countries. Sachin, over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rudra. Uh, good morning to all. I think we had excellent uh, keynote address uh, uh, by Mr. Mitab Kant. Uh, he has set in the ball rolling, and I think uh, issues that he has placed on table are absolutely important in terms of how India takes forward the G20 presidency, in what way we showcase uh, India's accomplishment. And I think he's absolutely right in terms of emphasizing bringing in fellow developing countries. His emphasis on Global South is something which is also echoing what uh, Dr. Jaishankar said in the inaugural session and what Prime Minister said in Bali. And I think uh, Mr. Mitab Khan quoted Prime Minister in terms of uh, bringing forward the idea as to how we take technology to our fellow partner countries. The idea of soft power that Mr. Mitab Khan alluded to is something which is uh, there. We would have to see how India's traditional negotiating positions, which are there on technology, on access, on equity from technology, its inclusion, they are some of the uh, framework elements which are extremely important when we talk about India's G20 uh, leadership, but also India's uh, uh, prowess related to uh, technology. And that's where I think the new approach, the new uh, power game, as we heard in the inaugural session today, is very important. And I'm so uh, glad to begin, Ashley, with you. Uh, as, as, as a commentator on geopolitics, how you unbundle role of technology, as we heard from Mr. Amitabh Kant in the most eloquent manner, as to how our accomplishment not only narrates our own story, but also narrates a story uh, which is becoming almost, if I can bracket it as a soft power, which he also did. But in, in that sense, the geopolitics also dominates how you see the whole uh, development in, in the context that you have been commenting on geopolitics. So thank, thank you, Sachin. Let me address that question in several layers. Uh, to start, every age has found some critical driver which drives the economics and the politics of the age. In the early 20th century, it was essentially industrialization and the ability to bend metal. Today, it's technology in different forms which we loosely describe as information communication technologies because they are truly ubiquitous. And the countries that dominate uh, computing technologies will essentially be those countries that end up the most competitive in the international system. So as Dr. Jaishankar said this morning, this rivalry is going to be more than just technology. It's going to spin over into politics. Now, what does that mean for India? I think India's digital achievements give it a real leg up in a world that is divided into many competing approaches. So let's start with the United States. The United States has created sophisticated technologies primarily through the private sector, which has developed both soft and hard infrastructure, and uses product monetization to essentially pay for that development. The EU has essentially piggybacked on that model, but has put very strong privacy rights and consumer rights, but essentially on a private sector model. China is an entirely different universe on the opposite side. What India has managed to do is actually bring together the private and the public in a virtuous interaction. And what Mr. Khan spoke earlier about digital public goods serving as the backbone on which many private entities can then piggy on becomes a solution 
that is very attractive, especially to countries that do not have a highly sophisticated technological sector. So in that sense, you know, we often talk about India as being a bridging power. It's going to be very interesting to see whether the Indian solution, which uses a digital public backbone, creates a platform for private entities to then work off that backbone, becomes the new bridging solutions, particularly in the countries of the global south, where they do not have a private sector of the fecundity and the sophistication that we have in the US. And I think part of India's ambition in the G20 presidency year is really to just promote the use of this model and see whether it can become a new standard uh, for countries outside the advanced OECD economies. Thank you, Ashley. As you would agree, uh, those who bring in technology on table, uh, they also contribute in terms of how you do the norm setting in terms of global governance. How you look at this new role for India? We have largely been norm takers and non not contributing to norm setting. With this rise in technology power that we are talking about, and it is not confined anymore to digital technology per se, we are doing innovation as uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant emphasized. We are contributing, as Dr. Jayshankar mentioned, in nuclear technology, in biotechnology, and many other, uh, even convergence of nano, biotech, and ICT, unique initiatives by uh, several companies in India now. How you look at India contributing to the global governance component of technology. And, and from that perspective, I'm also trying to connect what Prime Minister said in Bali uh, at the G20 meet in terms of uh, we contributing and accelerating uh, collective action. So this whole idea of open source technology, unlike what US stood for uh, intellectual property, which is going right up to utility patents and things like that. So how you carve out a situation where you are committed more in terms of collective gain, and which both uh, 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 Dr. Jay Shankar and uh, uh, Shyamitab Kant emphasized. So I don't want to have an excessively cynical view on this, but the golden rule is essentially who has the gold makes the rules, right? So it's not sufficient to say that we have a superior conceptual model which is built on open standards. I think you're going to have to ask a second question. Do you have the resources to encourage others to essentially adopt that model and thereby create an ecosystem which creates the opportunities that you want? My view is that India has a brilliant idea the question that I think still remains to be seen is whether India, one, will have the resources to entice others to adopt that idea, because adoption is a costly process. It does require resource commitments. And two, whether India can persuade the international community, in particular, international financial institutions, to provide money to countries to adopt the Indian solution. Now again, this is where we're going to get into geopolitics and to be you know, very blunt about it. There is going to be a US model that is very different. And while India and the United States partner in so many areas of geopolitics, this is one area where there will be an uneasy coexistence and we will have to find terms of managing what will be a rivalry between an open model and a proprietary model. And I think this is a fight that will be worked out country by country, institution by institution. So we are just at the beginning of this process. We haven't, the last word has not yet been spoken. Thank you, thanks Ashley. Let me now turn to Mr. Sunil Mittal. Uh, uh, good morning, sir. I think uh, at the outset, as uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant also mentioned, let me congratulate uh, uh, Bharti Enterprises for contributing to the immense infrastructure that the country may be proud of, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, digital infrastructure, but also in terms of connectivity that, that you have provided. But as it says, Dil uh, Mange More. So I think what, what, what you see in terms of what more is to be done when we talk about digital infrastructure in this country. <clears throat> Thank you, Sachin. Uh, first of all, let me say, even uh, people like us who are long-term practitioners of, you know, 
digital infrastructure, creating of digital highways in the country, are left stunned when you, in a very small, encapsulated manner, hear all the progress that has been made that Mr. Kant talked about this morning, the data that he spewed out in terms of the numbers and the sheer scale of what is being done in this country is truly mind-boggling. And that India is now today ready to use that, not as a hard gold or hard asset to trade with the world, but what we heard from Mr. Kant was soft power. We will be happy to share the gains that India has made in the digital area with the rest of the world on bases which are not extractive. So India has its oil now, the new found oil, which is our digital stack, which is our uh, you know, new found enthusiasm of young tech entrepreneurs, the startup culture, the massive amount of work that has been done on digital identity, the Jam Trinity, as the Prime Minister has uh, titled it, the Jandhan, the um, you know, banking account for all, linked through mobile, and digital identity is a very, very powerful tool. And I can tell you, we use it all the time for our KYC, for onboarding millions of customers every week. And the cost to do that is mind-boggling. It's, it's absolutely nothing. We're talking about, you can't even count it in cents. Now, there are countries out there, 133 countries we heard, which are crying out to get onto such kind of activities. And they can't look to the West. It's too expensive. It's IP-based. Anything that you touch from there is extremely expensive. India couldn't afford it. And if India wouldn't have found its own rhythm, it would have been left far behind. Because as you all know, India's hard infrastructure is still woefully inadequate. While we are you know, moving at breakneck speed, we need decades to get to a world-class infrastructure. But that is where I would say the digital substitution that we found at a very, very low cost at frugal levels on mass scale is the answer to the world. And uh, there will be affluent countries which will want all the bells and whistles that the US will provide. But there are lots of countries. I, I work in 14 countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. They cannot afford that. But can India plug its uh, you know, soft power there? And absolutely yes. And that's something that India is already working on. And I personally feel that this could also be a tool for India to regain or reclaim Africa which, to my mind, the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've lost to China. Africa was always uh, much more closer to India, especially the eastern part of Africa. And it kind of yielded to you, uh, China, who put out big checks and big projects. And this will be the way for us to get back into African hearts and minds. Coming back to India, I think what was very important was to lay out a digital infrastructure. And I've been a traveler on this journey from 1980 to 83. Uh, when we started manufacturing India's first digital phones. And to that extent, uh, I would say what has been achieved here has been absolutely tremendous, whether it's fiber highways, whether it is the radio waves, whether it's been the massive uh, you know, proliferation of mobile networks. And now the new enthusiasm that India has found through space, which will be the SATCOM delivered to those places, which may perhaps never be covered for the next 10, 15 years, deep in uh, rural India, deserts, mountains, forests, oceans, in air, and all that is coming as well. So I would say India has put in very high amounts of hard dollars in building the infrastructure on which what Mr. Khan described as the ecosystem that has been developed. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. I mean, this, this is a very, very capital intensive industry. It requires billions of dollars. It's a relentless thing. Sometimes we feel we are on a treadmill. You just keep on running. I mean, there is really no pause. You move from one technology to another. By the time we had rolled out 3G, it was obsolete. We had to quickly move to 4G. And as we have put out billions of dollars in 4G, including on Spectrum, we have 5G upon us, which is probably going to have the fastest and widest rollout anywhere in the world. And we know now the talk of 6G has started. So. There is really no, no respite here. So I, all I wish is government keeps on looking at this structure, infrastructure in a more benign way. And one area where I keep on always raising my voice is it is still a very heavily taxed sector. And that is where the government needs to focus on. If this is indeed the fundamental platform for how India is going to deliver to its masses all the goodies that the government needs to give it to its society, I think we need to be 
taken better care of. It's very important that we have a robust, sustainable digital infrastructure providers in the country. Thank you, Mr. Mittal. Thanks a lot. Good that you referred to Africa. Uh, when I was doing my work, uh, Logic of Sharing, uh, with the Oxford University Press, I did visit a couple of African countries and saw the CSR that Airtel is doing in uh, several of these countries. I think it's absolutely important what you emphasize in terms of uh, not just as corporate social responsibility, but also be connecting with Africa, with fellow countries. My next question to you is more in terms of India's G20 presidency. As Mr. Mitab Kant mentioned, uh, uh, the technology contribution, the, the role uh, that we discussed this morning of geopolitics, how you look at India's G20 presidency from your own sector and your own experience, how you look at uh, in what way India can contribute and what are the sectors you think uh, the Indian G20 presidency should contribute in? Well, I think um, G20 has come to this country and uh, this, uh, this presidency at a very difficult time at one level, but equally a very, very important and exciting time. What can India contribute through this one year of presidency? I think a lot of things can be done. First and foremost, I think the uh, world is a very fractured place today. Unfortunately, we'll be taking over when the world is really in many parts of the globe at loggerheads. There are many, many uh, you know, fault lines that have developed in the last uh, just 12 months, 24 months. And can India you know, use its uh, you know, strength, its uh, long-standing image of a peace-loving nation to bring some of these warring factions together? And we all know that India can really talk to both sides. And that is the uh, power that India enjoys. It is accepted by both sides. More importantly, the two warring factions also accept India as, in some sense, a peace broker. So India has a role to play. And it can probably uh, use this uh, platform to start to bring some harmony around the globe. We will never be able to probably agree on all the issues, but there are larger issues at stake. People will be really facing poverty and hunger across the globe. We need to fix the situation there. Secondly, much has been talked about. I won't take too much time. India will use this opportunity for calling out on the digital divide. And I think the Prime Minister made a point uh, in Indonesia that that will be one of the areas where the government of India will work. And the third one really is India will connect G20 to Africa in a much more deeper and meaningful way. And it must do that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Mittal. Let me now turn to uh, Ms. Uh, Nivruti Roy. Thanks a lot for joining the panel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you uh, very much. As you heard uh, Mr. Kant, uh, you know, explaining in terms of what would be our priority, what would be our connect, we also heard Mr. Mittal uh, explaining out his ideas and his uh, recommendations and suggestions. Let me bring to you the Bali Declaration, uh, where they have talked about uh, 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 digital connectivity, digital infrastructure. And that's where I, I would very much like to ask you how you see uh, this whole question of uh, digital infrastructure, particularly if I juxtapose requirements that are there in our own neighborhood. Since I'm also on the board of the Reserve Bank, we are grappling with this question of SWIFT and the alternatives of SWIFT and the challenges that we are facing uh, in several parts of the world. So how you look at this uh, infrastructure more from the point of view of our neighbors? How do we facilitate? As you are aware, uh, one of the morning's uh, breakfast discussion here is also about digital currency. So how you look at this uh, question of uh, infrastructure and neighborhood? Sure. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. And you heard a little bit of what, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you talked about Africa and importance of Africa and the distance, you know, proximity to India versus China. Let me just set a little bit of a context. You know, during COVID, what happened? The world ran on the technologies of shoulders, uh, shoulders of technology whether it was shopping, whether it was actually working, it did not matter where you were located. That told me that distance does not matter. What matters is trust and what matters is technology. So just for a moment, I'm trying to make you imagine a world map. Today the world map is based on geography, the land masses, the water. What I'm imagining is a world map which is based on 
technology which is based on digital and which is based on trust. What you will see is a, is a map that emerges where India will have neighbors who we trust. Whether it is you know, United States, whether it is Israel, whether it is Japan, whether it's Australia based on Quad or I2U2 or G20, you name it. It's going to be based on trust. Now how this will happen is you will not see a political map, you'll not see a geographical traditional map, you'll see a digital ma map. And all of the countries will be connected which have trust. And believe me, we have technologies already that can enable. There's digital highway that we just heard that is being built. Already, you know, many of us have experienced sporadic 5G on our phones. And, uh, you know, you see the value of 5G. But, the, but, you know, the roads up to 4G were getting heavily, heavily, uh, you know, overutilized. So then we opened up uh, 30 gigahertz beyond more highways for 5G. What I want to say is, if the world is going to be built on digital trust and trust-based geography, what is going to define, you know, what used to be land is data. Data and the trust based on data, the corridors that you build with other nations, and therefore the value that you can bring based on collaborative trust and innovation and invention. India is synonymous to data, India is synonymous to software, and India is synonymous to the large number of people, which is essentially data factory. What we need to do to build those infrastructure is focus on two things, manufacturing and manufacturing with quality, and the other thing is stable policies. And I really believe that the need of the world is collaborative innovations, and we have a lot to offer. We need to build those trust-based geographies that can drive innovation. So the infrastructure that I talked about is going to be leveraging the highways that are already being built and technologies that can then offset the data uh, you know, privacy, the data localization, all of those requirements through you know, technologies like federated uh, learning. Federated learning will enable your data to stay where it is and yet create the value of the data where the data is required. So I honestly believe digital neighbor is what you're talking about. Digital trust-based geography is what we're talking about. And then leverage all of that, and that's the infrastructure. The other thing I want to highlight is, I come from a semiconductor industry, so I have to bring it up. The semiconductor market today is about half a trillion. By 2027, 2030, the semiconductor requirement is going to become one trillion. Synonymous to that, in India today, the data centers that we have, you know, whether it is enterprise or whether it's hyperscaler, we have about 750 megawatt of data center requirement today. My belief is by 2027, 2030, it's going to at least double. So two gigawatt is the need. Just like semiconductor is doubling up, data center is going to double up. Double up. So in digital infrastructure is digital connectivity. Digital infrastructure is digital storage, which is these data centers. And we have to enable doubling up, if not more. And the last thing is, so compute. Artificial intelligence, uh, hyperscalers, uh, HPC high-performance kind of compute, and I honestly believe that India, by 2025, will have its own indigenous HPC if it works with its strength, which is software, and like I said yesterday, hardware is nothing different than software. It's a very expensive software that gets printed. So leverage our software and mathematical capability, leverage our people, and enable it with stable policy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Rai. I think, uh, uh, as you rightly said, we need manufacturing and we need uh, stable policy. Before Mr. Amitabh Kant moved out of Niti Aayog, one important contribution, brilliant contribution, was PLI scheme. That has given huge impetus to manufacturing. And, as, uh, and that was a paradigm shift, because uh, hitherto we assumed that uh, services sector would uh, steer us through. But now we are realizing that uh, uh, for Atmanirbhar India, we have to have manufacturing with us. You emphasize that point 
My question to you is in terms of uh, India's self-sufficiency in this sector or even to bring in uh, supply chain resilience, how you look at the next few policy uh, steps that are needed uh, to go in that direction? Um, the way I look at how policy can enable in m many different ways is you have to look at the entire end-to-end uh, you know, system. If you talk about semiconductors, if you talk about manufacturing, you have to look at supply and you have to look at demand. So the ecosystem needs to be built up for manufacturing. In, in terms of, I'll just give you an example of semiconductors, you have to have fabulous design houses. You have to be building IPs. You have to be able to either import those very expensive equipments, because I don't think self-reliance, self-sufficiency means do everything yourself. You need to lead to do and then you know bring in things that you don't want to build expertise so my whole suggestion is look at the entire supply demand look at all of the components that are going to be required from raw materials from clean gases from water just let me tell you for a fab which a lot of us are so interested in each day a mega fab needs 12 million liters of water a day Smaller fabs, you know, can go with one-fourth of it, which translates into thousands of people's need of water. So we have to have that ability. So before we start thinking there are many, you know, crawl, walk, run kind of steps, enable assembly, enable packaging, enable validation of semiconductors. Then look at, you know, what can we do in terms of, and this journey doesn't have to be, you know, several uh, years. We can do it in a few years. Like I said, I believe in partnership. China was not built by itself. China started supporting United States for manufacturing. Japan, at one point of time, was very poor in quality. I remember my parents used to say, Japani hai kya? To now, when you look at the quality, it's amazing. You look at, you know, many countries which thought their race was, you know, supreme, getting down to supreme quality. So we have to look at, you know, what are some of the lessons. I know that history is... A good teacher, you don't always you know, plan on history, but you learn from history. And therefore, I really believe that our manufacturing has to be given importance, quality is something, enabling policy where we can import certain things that we do not want to build, but drive with leadership and build a vision that we can accomplish. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Rai, for, for uh, detailed explanation in terms of how you see manufacturing. Let me now turn to Mr. Mitab Kant. Uh, sir, you explained this uh, idea that India has in terms of our uh, G20 presidency. India emerging as uh, a force uh, uh, for good, contributing in terms of uh, new areas as uh, geopolitics, geo-environment is evolving. How you see India playing that role of, of, uh, uh, of force for good and, and in what way you think uh, we can contribute? I've been a long-term believer that uh, you can't transform uh, the lives of citizens without going digital and without going green. And, uh, you know, actually, it's been three and a half years uh, while I carry debit card and credit cards, I've not used them in India. Uh, you know, I've not been to an ATM machine for over four years. Uh, I have not been to a physical bank for over five years, and I think physical banks in India are almost virtually dead now. Uh, the only time I have used my debit card was uh, debit credit card was when I went to San Francisco to meet my daughter to hire a Uber car. Uh, throughout the COVID, I got my shots, my booster shot. It was all digital. Uh, my daughters were all paperwork in the United States. So what it really demonstrates is that in terms of technology, we are way ahead. We are way ahead. Uh, this has happened not, not because of government alone. This has been a unique uh, work of private sector innovating on top of the rail track built by the government. And that innovation, as I mentioned, a whole range of uh, innovators, uh, in the private sector have done. So my view is that if you want to transform the lives of uh, 4 billion people of the world who do not have a digital identity, if you want to transform the lives of 2 billion people who do not have a bank account, 
I mean, we've put 470 million bank accounts, we've put money, 600 schemes of the government, we put money straight into the bank account without a single peso of leakage. I've also worked in the same government where almost one of our prime ministers said 85 percent of the money, rupee that we give was a leakage. We now do 600 schemes without a single peso of leakage straight into the bank account of the beneficiary. And therefore, all through the COVID, we could take care of our citizens because of the infrastructure built. Now, this means that it has required a huge amount of work around digital identity first. It has, without identity, it wouldn't have worked. It has required a huge amount of work and a huge amount of political will to build bank accounts for every citizen, every citizen. And it has shown tremendous amount of private enterprise that 850 million people in India have uh, smartphones. I mean, these are the people who've transformed. So if you want to transform lives in South Africa, or if you want to transform lives in Africa or Latin America, and if you want to ensure that they are able to get government benefits, or if they are able to really transform agriculture or education or health, there is no other option but to do the kind of digital transformation model which India has pursued. It can't be the big tech model of the United States. It just can't be. It can't be on the basis of the, the model built by Europe, which is focused on privacy but killed innovation. And therefore, the model for the rest of the world is what India has built. And that is the model which will transform lives. So if you want a human-centric approach to growth, if you want to transform citizens' lives, if you want to transform lives of women, which India has done now, the only way out for financial inclusion and for many other transformations will be the model which India has pursued. And therefore, it's not about putting bucks, it's about, it's about spreading this, this model of innovation and this rail tracks across many of these underdeveloped and developing countries of the world. But you have to understand that there are 70 countries in the world which are facing a global debt crisis. And they are facing a global debt crisis because some countries in the world have given them global debt. They have given them debt which is totally opaque, which is non-transparent. Totally opaque, non-transparent. In some countries, the deal was that you will not even bring it before the parliament of that country. We are not saying that. We are doing it in a very transparent manner that this is something which has been built. Please take it. And take it through our innovators. And this is the only way you will be able to transform the world. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Kant. I think uh, as we heard in the video uh, that was played before this session, uh, uh, Melinda mentioned in terms of uh, digital divide, and, and you just now referred to that. How you see global community can work together, India can provide the necessary leadership in terms of overcoming this digital divide, because still quite a few people are left outside this uh, uh, ambit of uh, digital empowerment that you are referring to. So, Sajin, first and foremost, you have to understand that, uh, uh, you know, America has built up a model where it has, you know, made itself dependent on one supplier across the world. There are top 12, look at the top 15 companies of the United States of America, 89 to 92% supply is coming from one supplier across the world. It's not about decoupling, it's about totally demonopolizing this. Unless and until you don't demonopolize, look at the situation you're ending up. 44% of the chip supply coming from Taiwan. 44% of the chip supply coming from Taiwan. China-Taiwan crisis comes in. America does sanctions. The whole world comes to a standstill. Defense manufacturing, automobile manufacturing, mobile manufacturing. America will put the whole world to a standstill. And therefore, it's for America to understand that it needs to build many other suppliers across the world. Their companies are still not getting away from the earlier model that they've built up. And it's for Ashley Tellis to respond to this. <laughs> Ashley, Ashley, Ashley. I'm, I'm, Ashley, I'm hold on. I'm dying to. <laughs> I'm dying to. You, you got excited, actually. So I want, to make, I want to make two points. Yeah, okay. We cannot conduct these conversations as if every outcome is a product of state choice. There is an entire universe out there of business entities which are going to make decisions based on efficiency and profit. If we've ended up with a particular ecology of semiconductor manufacturing, 
It is because some countries in the world have demonstrated extraordinary efficiency and have utilized those efficiencies to develop monopolies. Now the state, when it is confronted with these monopolies, basically shudders and looks for ways of diversification. But to imagine that the state is going to find a solution to what is a normal process of distribution decisions and allocation decisions made in the marketplace, I think is fatal. And it goes back to a point that Nivruti made earlier when we talk about manufacturing. Yeah. Just because we care about ensuring ourselves against worst case outcomes, we cannot pursue economic policies that take us exactly to that place where we produce worst case outcomes. In other words, we cannot have national strategies that are oblivious to notions of comparative advantage, that are oblivious to notions of efficiency. If you attempt to create an economic system where you throw comparative advantage and efficiency out of the window, you are not going to create the world that you want. So the challenge for us is to take the ideas that Amitabh laid out, which are attractive on their own terms, and begin to ask ourselves hard questions. Who's going to finance this? On what terms? These are the kinds of issues that I think are going to become the debates in India's G20 presidency. Because it's one thing to say, I'm going to use the bully pulpit to talk about the India model. The India model is very attractive. But the India model is not cost free. Someone has to pay for it. Someone has to pay for those railway tracks which the Indian people paid for over the last several decades, right? Those are the kinds of issues that I think are going to be bread and butter issues that we've got to think about as we go through the next year. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. I think uh, as an economist, I have a problem in terms of how geopolitics dominates the whole idea of efficiency and productivity. The idea of dominance takes precedence in terms of decisions on uh, productivity and efficiency. But let me now, I think, uh, just quickly open the floor. Uh, if there are one or two questions, Rudra, I think we have a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I think uh, we, can, uh, we can take at least two or three questions here. Uh, yes, right in the middle here. Uh, can I take a question? Yeah, yeah please. Hi, uh, Smita Sharma, I'm an independent journalist. Uh, to Mr. Sunil Bharti Mittal, on the draft telecom bill, there are apprehensions that this is an overreach on the scope beyond telecom and perhaps a return to the license Raj in the Department of Telecom. Your thoughts, sir, reservations, concerns. And Mr. Amitabh Kant, you know, Dr. Jaishankar spoke about geopolitical trust. You are talking about a humanitarian digital transformation. But India, unfortunately, has a dubious distinction of being among the top countries where digital shutdowns are happening frequently, affecting the life and liberties of human beings. You have a data privacy bill. The new version looks even worse off than the last version that came in, with serious concerns about data privacy. So, you know, uh, the, the kind of challenges that we face really domestically when we talk about geopolitical trust. Thank you. I would just pick up two more questions and then would come back to my panel. Uh, anybody, I think you have to come at the mic and, and, and speak there. So, anybody who's... Hi. Uh... Yeah, please. Hi, this is Harsh from Google Research. Thank you for the talks. So, Mr. Ashley mentioned the open model versus the proprietary model. Great point. So I think after payments, the next frontiers are in agriculture, health, languages, where again, open data, open secure data and open models can actually pave the way for innovation. We want to support that. But the challenge we face sometimes in nodal agencies is infrastructure, where we are retro moving from secure to the data centers, and a lack of trust. My question is, how, how can public sector and private sector together solve these problems for innovation for the future. Thank you. Thank you. I would take one more, I think, here yeah. on this side. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about uh, digital assets that uh, was uh, briefly discussed in the panel. Uh, what is India's current stance in terms of having a, you know, building towards a larger ecosystem, of course, it has been, uh, India has been looking forward to international collaboration, but if we just keep that aside and just talk about India's stance, because on one side we see humongous taxes that have been imposed, and on the other we see India 
trying to be the leader in uh, you know uh, taking these conversations forward so what is being done uh, in that particular domain thank you i would now turn back to my panel would request sunil ji to start well just before answering the question i would just like to you know add that you know sort of join in what uh, mr kant and ashley have talked about uh, you know mitigation plans for the world you know actually i mean you and i have worked together for over a decade now and you know we uh, agree on a lot of things but on this particular one i think it will be disingenuous to for us to say that the policy making does not shift centers of gravity it does that china today is the world's factory is an outcome of a major policy decision taken decades back by the us it could have been india by the way uh, somehow the eagle never sort of landed here it sort of flew over us many times but finally it went to china the fact is that of the policy choice and i think what mr kant is saying is probably important that today there are levers of policy makers to shift those such that nobody ever comes to a point where we suffer heavily so i would say in that regard india and us are cooperating in technology in space in defense now and that will ensure in the next 10 12 years we'll have a better balance so that's the only point i will make to answer to the point on the draft um, uh, digital policy that has been put out i think it's still a draft first of all a lot of uh, debate is going on deliberations are going on ton of uh, comments have been received by the government back what will finally come out i think we need to hold uh, my you know breath there my own view is government is very alive to my mind the policy from the old ntp that uh, i have worked with to where we are today has been a progressive one taking into account not only the needs of the society but importantly the massive shifts in technology today a mobile phone is a television and a television is an internet now i mean the world is dramatically altered from where the national telecom policy was so i would say let's not prejudge before anything is finalized to my mind there is a you know every voice in the market is talking about their needs and they are lobbying for their own uh, corners my own view is we have a very very uh, you know sound government very solid leadership here which will decide and determine what is best for our country in the end you are in a democratic setup and they are following the norms of inviting comments they are deliberating upon it you are already seeing shifts there was a noise about tra powers being compromised i think the government has already clarified that is not the case so i would say we should be very positive in looking towards the future because india is committed to a digital framework that enables the society to thrive ms rai you want to add anything um the only thing i can say is you know um when you look at india there are two ways to look at india and i've been you know from working in an mnc a us based company i've been saying this uh, to my company as well look at india with the gdp number and look at india with the gdp per capita number when you look at gdp of course you can compare india to a germany to a uk and france and so on when you think of the infrastructure that is required for many of these technologies to be able to work whether it's digital highway whether it's the trusted corridor you need to think of india and central gdp kind of capability so i really think the platform we need to build is competitive comparative to the kind of countries i mentioned however when it comes to consumption you have to look at enabling the gdp per capita which means you have to enable your technology to be affordable to be scalable and one thing i want to tell you and i i kind of you know um echoing to what uh, uh, mr khan said think of india the amount of data you consume per month is leading the world with the cheapest 25 cent as compared to 10 dollars in so many countries we are consuming the maximum number of gigabits per month which means if data was currency you are consuming the most amount of currency and that's why most innovation is required because there is a huge gap between our gdp and gdp per capita but looking at what the government has enabled whether it's a platform for digital identity unified payment there is health platform being built i myself interested in building ai open source platform to to enable you know the gdp per capita to leverage that and drive those startups so i really believe india has tremendous opportunity and whether it is central level government or whether it's huge companies like airtel or reliance 
each one of them have an onus to look at how do we build that platform that the rest of India can innovate on and build those, you know, many, uh, you know, startups and new technologies. We need to enable, and the onus is on people like me as well. So I, I really feel that uh, the government has to play its part in building those platforms. The companies sitting here have to uh, play their part in building that platform such that the rest of India, the 65% of India which is living in the, the rural areas can get connected, can get access to education, can get access to the healthcare. So I, I really feel that we can do it and uh, we need to work together. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Rai. Actually, any closing sentence? One sentence? Well, I just wanted to say something in response to the question asked about the public versus the private sector. And my prejudices are very simple. The private sector is a far more efficient provider of goods and services than government. And the role of government must be to establish sound policy frameworks and to address questions of market failure. If the government does those two things well, the private sector will take care of the rest. So, no, um, I agree with uh, Ashley that uh, sound policy frameworks are critical. But sound policy frameworks should not lead to over-dependence and one country and building monopolies in one part of the world. Secondly, sound policy framework should not lead to excessive protectionism, which the present Inflation Reduction Act of United States of America. Mr. Biden has got all policy framework right now, except for the IRA protectionism. You are saying that I'm going to give $3 per kilogram for green hydrogen produced in the United States of America, even though I'm not climatically suitable and even though I may be the most inefficient in the world. I mean, India's climatically blessed. You've, that, but that one policy has brought green hydrogen projects from Australia to India to Korea all over the world to a standstill. Get the policy framework right if you feel that the government policies are critical. Without that, you will not enable, instead of making the world go green, you brought going green to a standstill. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think uh, a big hand to my panel. This was uh, really, really uh, very exciting, very stimulating uh, uh, panel discussion today. I think there is no need for me to summarize it. Uh, you must have gathered the perspectives that are emerging, the uh, conflicts, the contestations that are there in the policy regime the need for uh, global leaders to be more responsible when they are setting the norms, when they are uh, grappling with the world which is getting shifted to another part of the uh, globe. And that, I think, is something we all have to prepare ourselves to. As Mr. Khan said, norm setting is something which I emphasized in the beginning is extremely important. And, and that to be inclusive is, is absolutely necessary with technology as we heard in the first session in this session that base is evolving that is changing we heard the panel india's g20 presidency would contribute in terms of this new order emanating out of the strength of technology it is applicable as much as to access uh, of technology that is there both in the frontier areas as well as in traditional areas but it is also equally important for finance not only from financial inclusion perspective, but also in terms of the way norms like Basel norms have been defined. The fact that fragmentation of finance has come in, largely again the credit goes to the United States of America. Uh, for fragmentation of development finance, uh, green finance, SDG aligned finance, and finance that is uh, coming on table under uh, the uh, uh, umbrella of climate finance. So I think this fragmentation of, uh, of finance, the uh, uh, fragmentation of technology governance regimes, and uh, the beneficiaries, the huge digital divide that uh, uh, Melinda Gates talked about in her uh, presentation today in the video. I think there are several issues that our panel has raised. I'm sure uh, Rudra and his team must have captured. So thanks a lot. A big hand to my panel, and we stop here. Thank you.